wonderful to see so many people here for a literary, artistic, musical adventure this evening. I think we're all going to enjoy ourselves. Uh, we'll be using microphones in just a minute, um, but I really wanted to welcome you and tell you a little bit about what this is, Lost and Found, and uh, with our marvelous guests this evening. All of this is um, a project that's part of what's called the Marie Residency, and it's in memory of Marie Brandolini, a particularly wonderful woman who had died much too young. And uh, she had a home in Venice, and she spent a lot of time in Jerusalem. And those two cities are connected to this project. Um, the people who were invited to do a residency in Jerusalem here at Mishkan of Shananim are also invited to Venice as part of their project. Um, and uh, we're really happy that now we have with us Myra Kalman as part of the Marie Residency at Michigan of China. Welcome to you and welcome to all of you. My name is Evan Fallenberg and I am the host this evening and we are about to hear from a wonderful band um, that uh, I don't know if you've heard before. I've only recently been introduced to them. They're called the Jane Bordeaux Band and they should be walking in as I'm speaking. And I don't want to stall too much until they get here, but hopefully they're going to show up right on cue now. <laughs> Thank 
ישראל, נראה לי אם צריכה להיות קצת במוניטור או שהוא אולי הוא לא עובד. Something about the sound. We're going to play another song. And it's about a sweater. And my ex. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Doron, Amir, Mati, Toda. We'll see you again in a little while. Okay, I can see that some of you are already thinking, wow, it was already worth the price of admission. Great. Um, I'm really pleased to invite now Myra Kalman and Edgar Kerr to the stage, please. Hello there. Grab a microphone. Okay, so, so thrilled to have you here, uh, you. both of you, with us here in Jerusalem. Um, and um, I, I'd like to explain to the audience a little bit how I, I think this evening should work. Um, I've thought about this because these are two really special people and I want you to meet them in the right way. And many of you I think already know them, know their work, but I want to do something a little bit different. So the way I've been thinking about this evening is in kind of, I see it in concentric circles. So the first circle is getting to know each of these two people a little bit better um, as individuals. And the second circle is as collaborators. And the third circle is about creativity itself. What is the creative process and how do each of these people find themselves in that uh, creative process? And all that against the backdrop of Lost and Found and the residency that they're doing here in uh, Jerusalem. So um, by way of introducing them, first of all, I'd like to say something about um, the things that they've done. Um, so um, kind of thematically, let's call it. Publications, first of all. So Myra's written 18 children's books. She's a frequent contributor to New Yorker magazine, and she's now creating an illustrated column for the New Yorker based on travels to museums and libraries. She's uh, done two different columns for the New York Times, which are now appearing in book form, five books with the photography department of the Museum of Modern Art, and two books with the Cooper Hewitt National Design uh, Museum. Edgar has written five collections of short stories, one memoir, four graphic novels, four children's books, several screen pay plays, and op-ed pieces, which uh, I read a uh, quote, he said, uh, uh, unlike writing fiction, which is like levitating on air, writing op-eds is like doing the dishes or taking out the garbage, it's a chore. <laughs> so uh, we can talk more about that if you want to. Um, both of them uh, have done collaborations with other writers. For example, uh, Myra worked with uh, Strunk and White, well, not in person, um, with on, on the famous uh, The Elements of Style that anyone who grew up in America will know as sort of the Bible of style. And it's a, you th many of us think of it as the driest thing in the world, and Myra took it and jazzed it up with her uh, drawings. And uh, Edgar, for example, has done the uh, Tel Aviv Noir with uh, Asaf Gavron as his writing collaborator. Both of them have collaborated with dancers and choreographers for some really interesting work. So Myra did uh, the sets and costumes for the Mark Morris Dance Group. And uh, she's now working on a project with John Higginbotham. Uh, it's a dance performance of her book, the Principles of Uncertainty that's opening this summer at Jacob's Pillow and at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And uh, Edgar recently did worked with the Palobolus Dance Theater with his wife, Shira Geffen, on a surrealist fable called The Inconsistent Peddler that was performed at NYU last year. Both of them have collaborated with their spouses. Uh, Myra was the, was the co-designer with the late Tibor uh, Tibor Kalman uh, of uh, the Sky Umbrella, the famous Sky Umbrella, and a, a whole series of watches. Um, and anything I get wrong, you can co co uh, correct me later. And, um, and uh, has also worked with uh, Rick Meyerwitz on uh, the New Yorker Stan uh, New Yorker cover that many of you may know. Um, Edgar worked with his wife, Shira Geffen, on the wonderful film Jellyfish and is now working on a show for French television uh, that's about real estate and time travel, but in a good way. That's a quote. <laughs> Both of them do a lot of talking to the world. So um, Myra has some wonderful um, TED Talks like The Illustrated Woman, and there's something I didn't get to see yet about Toscanini's pants. Um, and um, Edgar is invited all over the world to speak to book festivals and uh, you know everything. And then the last column I want to call this is Other Cool Stuff that they've done. 
So um, Myra has an, exhi an exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, called Sarah Berman's Closet. Um, that is her mother's closet installed in the Metropolitan Museum. Um, she has something called the Met Museum Workout, where you do a workout in front of the pieces of art, and I'm doing it on July 13th. Um, unfortunately, not led by Myra. Um, there's an opera based on the elements of style uh, from Strunk and White, and she's designed mannequins for Pucci and fabrics for the fashion designer Isaac Mizrahi, and she's got a brand new exhibition at uh, the Israel Museum now called Beloved Dogs, and uh, it just opened a couple of days ago. And uh, Edgar's other cool stuff include um, being a tenant of the Carrot House, which is the world's skinniest residence, and it is in Warsaw. And he's a recent winner of the Charles Bronfman Pl Prize for conveying Jewish values across cultures and imparting a humanitarian vision throughout the world, and he's the first artist to have received this award. So I give you all of this because I really think it's important to understand the depth and the breadth that both of these people are working in. It's, an, it's amazing. It's really remarkable to hear all of these things and in so many different ways and so many um, really wild, wonderful ideas behind all of this. Um, so for the first part of our discussion, I wanted to ask each of you to tell us what you're working on now, what you hope to be working on as individuals, not what you're doing together. And uh, please jump in, okay? So, Myra, you want to go first? I mean, it sounds like, thank you, Evan. It sounds like after that we should just all go home. Isn't that more than enough information? We get a little bit exhausted from, from hearing that. But, uh, but, but, we, but we have fortitude, and we, and we keep going, So, uh, which is probably the motto of, of anybody who's doing anything. And so uh, the, uh, the ballet that I'm working on is really wonderful because uh, not only uh, John Higginbotham is this wonderful choreographer who danced with Mark Morris, and I'm doing the sets and costumes and animations and wrote it, and I'm also shockingly in it. So, uh, you know, I, I talk about how I always waited for Pina Bausch to get in touch with me, and she never did. <laughs> and I thought, this is really an outrage. Well, so, if, you know, you, you never know how it's going to come out, but John, John got in touch, so. Uh, and what's your role in that? Terrified object. And if you want to do a few pirouettes <laughs> for us, we're, we're more than happy to watch. No, I did that. You know, I was the duck in Isaac Mizrahi's production of Peter and the Wolf. Do you know that? In a, oh, in a giant tutu? Yeah. Right. Uh, that was one of my great, uh, great moments in life. And so um, <clears throat> I think that I said after this, I'm going to hang up my tutu. But uh, after this, uh, this travel, uh, this, you know, being in Israel, I'm going to France to do research for um, the, uh, the deep and and arduous research for a book by Gertrude Stein and illustrating the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. So uh, I've got to do the research. I've got to go there. And what does that include exactly? That includes drinking a tremendous amount of wine <laughs> in different places that she may or may not have been. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and, and then, uh, but, but I, I will go to her apartment and there is an archive. And I mean, there's actual work involved. And, uh, <laughs> and, so, and then, uh, and then there are more things. There's a cake book I'm working on. I'm collaborating with a cake with a cookbook author, and working on cakes. And um, after that, uh, more design for anthropology. So just a lot of a, a really a, a wonderful range of strange and and lovely projects. And then and looking forward to some kind of mythical sabbatical year, which keeps getting further and further away. And and just uh, how far down the line do you know what you're doing? Uh, at this point, probably about four or five years, something like that. Like an opera diva. <laughs> like an opera diva? Yeah. Is that what an opera diva is? Yeah, yeah, they know their schedules <laughs> three, four years ahead, something like that, yes. Okay, great, thank you. How about you, Edgar? What are you working on, and what do you want to be working on? Uh, I, I think I, I also o always work on a uh, few things parallelly, you know, and uh, I, I'm finishing my work on a on a short story collection my editor is in is here so I cannot lie she knows how how close I am it'll be ready tomorrow <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I'm I hope that next year I'll direct with my wife the TV series that I wrote about real estate and time travel that has to do with the death of my father uh, and uh, I'm co-writing a, a 
comedy for theater based on one of my short stories. And uh, Will you direct that as well? No, no. And I also, I kind of co-write some kind of a, a mystery but supernatural TV series. Okay, so you're working on a play. You've done dance, you're working on a play, a television series, and what did I just miss? Oh, a new, a new book. Yeah. Coming out as well, and all of this at the same time. And but you said you were directing, actually. Uh, uh, the the other TV series, the well the, 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 the the time travel one. Right. Yeah. How, and how with my wife together. Ah, okay. Right. Because I was gonna say, do you have you know, is this a first for you, the actual directing? Uh, I, uh, I when I direct, I always co-direct because I, well the feeling is that you know the w the one I really love writing fiction, but the one thing I don't like about it is that it's very lonely mm. and so when I make it film I say you know if I'm doing it on my own I might as well stay home and write a book you know I want to do it with somebody and I really feel that there is something about the collaborative effect you know that it's kind of for me I, I think that there is something uh, uh, very limited in the way that I see the world I actually traveling with Myra I notice it like I don't really look at the way I don't think about cakes, you know, <laughs> ever. <laughs> t t today we met I my... I think about them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we met my sister and they started talking about cakes. Now, <laughs> I know my sister for all my life and I talk to her about almost everything, but I would never think to talk to her about cakes, you know. <laughs> Good thing like you came, Mara. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I uh, Mara met my brother and after we met... And my brother is really like the most intelligent person I've ever met on earth you know really it's like super smart he he started studying in university math and computers when he was a wasn't even 15 years old he's really really smart and he, he thinks about million things and he's a social activist and and when Myra spoke to him and after he left she told me he, he has such a beautiful voice and <laughs> I was always so busy listening to my brother and trying to figure out half of what he was saying that I never noticed that he has such a nice voice. Well, now you know I wasn't listening to what he was saying. <laughs> so I was just <laughs> listening to his beautiful and looking at his lips and his nose. So, yeah, we look at different things, which, right. is, right. which is good. And that really is what's interesting about collaboration, when you're working with somebody who can show you the other half or, you know, the other whatever percent of what you're looking at, and it's different. It's different. Seeing something through somebody else's eyes is fascinating. It's I, I, what I feel many times, it's like, you know, uh, my, my favorite collaborator I, is uh, my wife. And wha what I really uh, think is that many times we, uh, we, speak, uh, we speak about the same thing in a different way. You know, like, I mean, like Myra not listening to my brother, which is natural, or not <laughs> understanding what he's saying. Uh, she the, f the reaction was that she has a, he has a beautiful voice, and I think that he has a beautiful voice and he has beautiful ideas, and I may try to follow his idea and she may try to follow uh, his voice, but the fact that we look at uh, different things doesn't mean that we're not going on the same direction. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, so you, you brought up the whole aspect of uh, collaboration, and I think it's pretty safe to say that this whole collaboration that you're doing together here in Israel had a start with the New Yorker piece that you did together, that you were brought together to do, which uh, I wanted to show everyone here. This is, this is it. Um, so this is how it started. And um, uh, how about if you two tell us about this? Tell us what this is, narrate it for the audience, and, and then tell us what the collaborative process was like for you. Uh, well, well, the thing is that I feel that uh, many times uh, some of the texts that I write are very short and they feel t to me like kind of subtitles for a film that was never shot, you know, like I kind of, like I not only I can imagine a visual to them, I can imagine many contradictory visuals to them and, and, uh, and uh, I, of course, I've, I've known Myra's work for a long time and uh, and uh, we have a, a mutual friend, and and I had to do a bunch of those really, really, really short texts, and I was uh, asking Mara if she would like to try and integrate them, because I didn't, I didn't have this kind of feeling that there should be a caption to a picture, but they should be 
like part of somebody kind of imagining and seeing things and uh, Myra was kind enough to give it a shot and we did it. And you know, the, um, uh, you know, for me writing and painting, I also try to write as, as little as possible. And if I could write a book, you know, that had one sentence, though I, I, I know I, I usually I can't shut up, but if, but I'd like to try to write a book that has one sentence. And then, you know, I mean, I mean many writers do that, but the sense of trying to give you what the digressions are and what the point is and, and, go, and then going off point uh, is a, it's a wonderful um, relationship between art and text. So this was a really lovely experience because, you know, in some way there is this pathos and humor that that flows in our world, and so it was it wasn't hard to do, and there are volcanoes in it too. There there are dancers on volcanoes, uh, which is, I love volcanoes. So. Um. So so basically, the text, the the entire text existed and then you gave it to Myra and you did with it what you did. Did you have to leave anything out? Did something not fit for you? Yeah, I, well, did I cut out a whole like section? No, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do that. Though I think there were, um, no, the, 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 you know, the way that I handle typography also is that, that, it, that it can be playful and of course it can make shapes and it can be something that you learn from working for children that you don't have to be confined to a very, you know, you shouldn't be confined to a rigid, format. So, uh, no, I kept all the words and uh, did my job. Okay, that's fantastic. And then this led to uh, the residency that you're doing now together. And um, the, the point of departure for this residency was Mark Twain's Innocence Abroad. Uh, he, you know, w made a famously grouchy, um, famously politically incorrect uh, uh, recounting of his trip around the Holy Land, uh, among other places, uh, exactly 150 years ago. This uh, the book was published uh, in 1867, and um, so you have had your own kind of uh, innocence abroad uh, experience here. So could you tell us about this a little bit? What you've been doing? How you've been going about it? Well, we're you know what we really are innocent. And I mean, now I'm abroad, but you know, they, so we really, we really, I mean, there is a, a, a tremendous, uh, there, I, I think that, I feel that between the two of us, of course, there's complexity and, and intelligence, but there's also a great naivete and curiosity. And, and so um, when Edgar and I met, uh, well, you know, I, I, w I thought well, maybe we'd, you know, we'd write a book that day or the next day, but you know, let's put that aside for now. But what, what did we do? We bought two envelopes together that was a big deal because, because the envelopes represent a letter, letters. The, on, the store was in a neighborhood where I had lived you know, with my, when, as a young child with my family and the resonance of those envelopes and that store and the conversations that we had with the men were very meaningful to me. I could probably write a whole section just about buying the envelopes and or the woman with the red umbrella, you know, when there was hail, the first, the one we went to the cafe together. So there are very vivid moments that are absolutely minuscule and trivial, which I find the most satisfying, of course. So I think uh, did but that but was we it, we right? We saw Saturn. We saw. We saw s right, and so we went from envelopes to Saturn. <laughs> Uh, well, well, when Mara came, I, f I was kind of thinking about uh, what, uh, who I would want her to meet, you know, and uh, and uh, me and my wife, we sometimes like to go to the uh, Arava area, and uh, we've met her, uh, an autodidact uh, astronomer uh, named Vinny, that she came from Holland, and she just she stays in the desert and looks at the stars and she has a very good telescope. And we went there and we w watched some stars. And we saw the rings of Saturn, you know, which looked as if somebody had taped a picture of Saturn onto a telescope and said, like, you know, this is it. But it was actually there in yeah. the sky. And we found out that Saturn, we, and we saw two of Saturn's moons and we know that Saturn has 53 Moons. Oh, 
unless someone in the audience can correct moves, that right? can number, say, which they were debating over earlier. It shouldn't be hard to figure out, but, but we, you know, we went to the desert, to this expanse that felt like we were on another planet to begin with. And I still have the, the, you know, the sand from the alva in my hair. And then we see Saturn, and we think, you know, well, what more do we need to do? Nothing. Oh, end of trip. End of everything. So two we're envelopes right. and one Saturn. And well, I, that's, I, I, it, that's I, what I'm saying. From the envelopes to Saturn, we're done. Well, I right? think that Vinny's kind of point of view is the, the, this whole idea of kind of uh, understanding uh, how vast the universe is uh, makes people uh, less angry and maybe kind of less... Uh, the, don't the, the thing of self-importance evaporates when you understand. Right. You're humble. Of course, you're humble, which you need to be every day, you know, a few times a day at least, uh, which isn't hard to be humbled. And then... And then... Uh, and there were other things along the way, you know, an amazing broken chair against a yellow shack that uh, next to a green bush, you know, so... W uh, we met a guy that has a successful bookstore for 30 years yeah. and, and si seemed to have never read a book. <laughs> and uh, right. we, a we asked him why, why did he yeah. chose to open a... a a, a bookstore 30 years ago, and he said that he he bought he opened a store for plastic furniture, but nobody bought it. And then <laughs> one of the neighbors said, "Try books. Everybody loves books." <laughs> and he's and he's and he's been successful for 30 years in this teeny little bookshop where you know I'd like to open a place next to a him. And also <laughs> he's the he's the uh, biggest uh, is bookseller of Romanian uh, books. Because he doesn't read any of his books, so he, does so he didn't mind buying Romanian ones. <laughs> and uh, and he became this kind of Romanian uh, emperor of <laughs> books. So all the Romanians buy from him. It's like a yes, little Romanian yes. cultural center. Do you center. think they do? Yeah. Uh, I think he has a lot of them. And yeah. he has so, mani so many books must. that you can sit on them, so you don't need plastic yeah. chairs anymore. <laughs> This is proof. You've, you've mentioned just two or three stops on your grand tour of the Holy Land, and you've already got enough material between the two of you, I think, for a few volumes, illustrated, annotated, and everything. That's fantastic. Are there any more stops on your itinerary, or are you done traveling no, around? We're, we're, um, well, I mean, there was Bethlehem, mm. uh, which one of us went to, but, but uh, the, the, I think I, you know, it was a really interesting uh, trip to go to, to the Banksy Hotel, and Edgar was with me, and, sp and actually we were toasting you all the time, because it w if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have gone there. And, uh, and I drew on the wall, and it was an incredibly uh, uh, intense experience in every way, can, can you just tell people what the Banksy Hotel is? Who Banksy I'm is? I'm sorry. Somebody doesn't know. So Banksy is a graffiti artist that that you know has kept his his identity secret, but he's an internationally famous, well established <laughs> he's a well established graffiti artist, <laughs> and he opened a hotel in Bethlehem, right on the wall. I mean, just he, they took an old house, and it feels uh, and they, and they made it into this kind of strange theme art hotel. It feels a little bit like Casablanca. Uh, with artists creating all kinds of interiors that are eccentric and strange. There's a wall full of cameras looking at you. There's a, a giant chimp uh, as a bellhop outside. So it's a th it's completely a theme, a fake theme place, and yet you're in a very very tense and real and tragic place too, among other things, for many different reasons. So there's a tourist situation. You're there. Your people are getting photographed in front of the wall, tour groups, and you think, who, what, you know, what is this? What is this thing? And, um, and it's so ugly, too, of course. I mean, but that's another conversation. And then, so what they do is that they paint huge sections of the wall white so they can screen movies or football or soccer games. And so there was a huge section that was painted white, and and they have a graffiti store that you can go and you can get a ladder and you can, you know. So there's the the, the marketing and it, it's so comp confusing. You really don't know what you're doing most of the time, which is how I feel here most of the time anyway. So, <laughs> so um, so I didn't I uh, didn't spray paint. I didn't. I know, but I just decided that I would um, make a list of cakes. <laughs> <laughs> and say, because of this cookbook that I'm working on, I was so I decided that I would make a list of cakes on the wall, say, what is your favorite cake? Um, 
drew a picture of a cake, and then we, we stopped people along the street and said, what's your favorite cake? And what we found out was that when you ask somebody what their favorite cake is, they, they really smile and they're very happy, and it doesn't matter where you're from or what your political leanings are. I like an eclair, you know, well, I like a straw. And people think about it and say, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, so that sense of intimacy, you know, which you can establish with somebody in a nanosecond on the street, which is, I think, is very real. I don't think it's superficial. I don't think it's phony. I think actually it's sometimes more real than real than many real relationships that I have. So um, Wait, I, I think you may have found a way to solve the Israeli-Palestinian well conflict. Well, that's right. Well, you know what I want to say. I just want to. I want to say then that we'll all die from cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all be very fat and happy. But I, I want to say that part of this trip, um, I really felt that if we didn't, if Edgar and I didn't solve, that there was some mission that we were supposed to solve the whole thing like, you know, by Sunday night. And that if we didn't, we were really failures. So here we are. <laughs> you have and another few days. I have to remind days. myself, wait a minute, this, we might not be able to do that. So, but your desire is to, you know, your desire is to, you know, say, how did, how did the heavens above help make this situation better? Right. Well, hopefully, I think cake is a, it's one tool like that hasn't piece. been tried yeah. yet, so why not? Yeah, and I call it cake piece. And I'm hoping that um, I can call them up and they didn't, you know, paint it away right away and that people will add the cakes that they like and then that'll be... I wish we had pictures of it, but I'm sure they'll be yeah. published somewhere. So, Edgar, you, you felt that um, one of the things that you should do together with Myra on her trip here was to visit members of your family. So can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Well, I, I talk a lot about my family, and my, Myra was just curious, mm -hmm. and she wanted to meet them. So today, she, uh, we visited my sister, who lives in Mea Shearim, and and she met my my mother, and of course my, my wife, my son, my brother. Yeah, and it, and again, you know, it was a very interesting experience because I think that uh, my relationship with my Maybe it's true for many people, but my relationship with my family members are very intimate, you know. So I, I'm kind of I'm I'm not used to uh, speaking to them with somebody who had just met them, you know. All the people that I know have known them for all of their lives. So, so it was interesting, uh, and like I I always have a feeling that you know that my family is very special. I guess most people do. And Myra tended to agree with me that my family was very special, so I liked her even more after that. <laughs> I, barged, I barged in. And after I said, oh my God, I'm so sorry to barge in, but I'm barging in again. Uh, I couldn't help it. They really are all in. You in mean to each different family member? Yeah. So yeah. tell us, what was, uh, <laughs> what was so wonderful? And are there any more that I have to... Uh, um, I think that they're all, besides being incredibly intelligent and articulate, and I did listen to you, what your brother was saying, though, <laughs> I, though I can't remember right now what he said. Uh, they're incredibly gentle and, f and fantastically loving in a very obvious and very tangible way. And I think that the kindness that the, the family has to each other and really, really listening is something. And they're also very, I mean, they're funny and they're interesting and all that. But I think that the, the thing that really overwhelms me in a very good way is the... Um, the kind, gentle being that um, the Carrot family is. And you wait till you meet mine. You're going to go, oh my God. What <laughs> no, but I have my, my two cousins are here and they're really wonderful too. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, you have to reciprocate. Well, that's what I was thinking. I was, you know, we're, we're, you know what is the next phase? But we'll see more relatives. More relatives. But, but, but you know that the, among my siblings, like, the, both my sister and my brother, they have this kind of uh, admiration for me because they see me as some kind of like Attila the Hun. <laughs> because they like, uh, th they see me, I don't know, arguing with taxi drivers or doing all those kind of things that, that they really don't believe that human beings are capable of, <laughs> you know? Like, you know, raising your voice or something because they are so... You do that? Of course. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't expect, uh, you know, yeah, you do that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You've seen it. I, I shout at Myra oh all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I put that's her in her place. You that's know, my humbling those moments. Americans. Those, those are my humbling yes. moments. Those Americans, they come here and they <laughs> think they own this country. You know, you should put them in their place. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, I you just got well. yours. Yeah. Life is it. not only cakes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we have the Iron Dome. We have the Mossad. You can't eat them, but they're very useful. You can make a cake. I always thought the Iron Dome was something that looked like a cake, like an ice cream <laughs> cake, you know, so. Um, uh, when, when I was asked to um, do this interview, uh, one of the things I did to prepare was um, I talked to the rector of uh, Bar Ilan University where I teach. Uh, her name is Professor Mary Faust, and she is an expert on the academic side in creativity. And I said, Mary, what, give me one book to read about creativity. Uh, as I want to get sort of on the inside of it, not as an artist, but you know, from the academic, from the mind side of it. How does it work? What is it? And she recommended a book uh, called Wired to Create by Scott Barry Kaufman and Carolyn Grégoire. And this is always my experience with technology, which is why I don't use it. Oh, there it is. Good. OK. Um, and uh, these are some, you know, actually, I've printed this for the two of you. So you can each have, you don't have to turn oh, around. Oh, thank you. Look at that. Okay. So um, uh, th what you're seeing there is basically the outline of the book. And um, she start, he, they start with something called, in the introduction, Messy Minds. And um, in the Messy Minds section, it's about a, p a preference for complexity and ambiguity and the contradictory extremes that give rise to the drive to create. And I can just tell you this one fact um, that, that, they, that they mention in that introduction on Messy Minds. They say that the average creative writer was in the top 15% of the general population on all measure of psychopathology. <laughs> but they also scored extremely high on all measure of psychological health. So just one example of this weird contradiction that takes place in, um, in creative people's minds and lives. And um, what I wanted to, uh, uh, as you can see here, um, the, the book is divided into 10 sections trying to get at what creativity is. And, and it, it includes imaginative play. And just after, just as I was reading this, I watched um, Leonard Bernstein in the um, Norton lecture series that he did at Harvard in the 70s. And in it, he mentions spending an entire night, instead of sleeping, he was making um, primordial sounds, um, trying to imagine how language evolved. So he lay in bed or walking around his house or something going, ma, moo. And, and I thought, well, there's imaginative play right there. I was, uh, you know, so as I was reading this book, I was seeing a great example of it. So, so what they discuss is imaginative play, passion, a passion for something, daydreaming, solitude, intuition, openness to experience, mindfulness, you know, being connected to, to things around you, like noticing um, Edgar's brother's voice, um, sensitivity, turning adversity to advantage, and thinking differently. And I was hoping that you would look at this list and just say what comes to mind to you when you see this list, what you can connect to or maybe disagree with from this list. I have all of those. All of them. <laughs> Me too. Yes. Yeah. There I kind of thought so. OK, well, don't make that the end of the discussion here. Um, I thought it was a really good question that was going to give us a whole discussion. And they just answered it in 12 seconds or less. But um, can, you, can you elaborate a little bit, please? We, we can do it like I do one, you do one, I do. So I imaginative play. So uh, all the time when uh, uh, my Shira and me are w with our son, uh, we invent all kinds of g games and activities, and it's really fun. It's like, you, like for example, when we wanted to teach him the ABCD, then we said, okay, we pick a situation. So for example, situation, uh, have a newbie, an alien coming from outer space, contemplating if to, to if you want to destroy Earth or not. And uh, Myra, you'll be a, a a a TV host who comes to interview that alien, not knowing that he may plan to win the world. And I'll be a neighbor that the two of you had woke up, woken up. Okay. And then what we do is like I have to say a sentence that starts with an A, and you have to say a sentence that starts with a B, and then you have 
So this is how... Don't how worry, we're not doing this, Myra. <laughs> <laughs> she was about to faint. Are you guys okay in the head? It's 8 a.m. in the morning. B, no, I'm just, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I was already planning my C. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> it runs in the family. It runs in the family. Yeah, but I'm saying inventing games. It's really. Yeah. It's like you know. It's like kind of like I don't know. When we went to Mexico, we said okay, uh, each have has to come up with a startup that uh, we seem feasible that you can do with a sombrero. <laughs> Think does about a sombrero drone. Does he ever say, Dad? Can I just have an egg, please? <laughs> I mean, you know. Well, actually, he's the engine behind it, I, and that's the thing. I think I think that I think that the that the why not think about something that you haven't thought about, you know, before, you know. Well, yeah, when you can think about a cake, okay. When you can think about something that is not a cake. I do think about things that are not. Cake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to say that all of those things, you know, the, the day daydreaming was something that I did full time when I was a kid. And, w and the, the, the gratitude I have to my mother who basically didn't stop me from daydreaming and that, that essential, and I know that I still do that, and you know, the, the sense of allowing your mind to wander into places, which goes with solitude and intuition and, uh, and all of those things. Um, there was a section here that is, uh, there was a section that isn't here. <laughs> I, thought that <laughs> I thought it was here. There was an in-between. There was like, you know, an 8A and 8B that I don't see here anymore. But no, I'm just making that up. But the, uh, that sense of being able to, the complexity, that's, that's what, the, the complexity, uh. that, that if, you're, if you're traveling through a creative process and you are acknowledging the complexity of your thought process and how... It, your mood changes, literally, and, and that's you know one of the things we talked about in Lost and Found, that you can accommodate tremendous uh, self-confidence and tremendous insecurity in the same moment, happiness and sadness in the same moment, and that you're navigating all those things constantly. There's no static place at all, and you just have to know, I mean, I say to keep moving, but to understand that those, all of those things are gonna be part of the, uh, a part of the process. And uh, it won't be one nice place somewhere over there. That that will never be. Uh, and uh, well, at least so that's just one little one little aspect of it. Well, that you did see it on here because that's really what the messy mind section is about. Messy minds. And okay, and right. I, I I said something that's <coughs> right, not right, up there, right. and that is what's in the messy mind section is about complexity. Right. That uh, you know there there is a complexity and these these odd contradictions and uh, ambiguities that seem to exist in the lives of of creative people or and or are embraced by creative people more than they're embraced by you know somebody less creative um, and then you know and I and I or I was telling I was telling uh, Etel's sister that I um, am torturing him with my dreams but uh, am torturing. I torturing you no 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 okay so uh, really so nice. I, I the dream I had last night was that a, a woman in a giant hat and I didn't know whether it was Suleiman the Magnificent or a woman in a giant hat but at any rate saying, uh, don't you remember when you were really depressed and you couldn't work? And I'm saying in the dream, no, 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 that's not true at all. I have never stopped working. I don't know what you're talking about. And when I woke up, I thought, how extraordinary that that has to be some kind of pers the perseverance of work, the actual saying, I'm not going to stop working even though I don't like something or I don't know what I'm doing, but that you keep working. I I never feel that I work. You never feel that you work. No, I always feel I always feel that everything I do is kind of an attempt to escape another thing that I need to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's really y y you know I uh, That's a good I I published a uh, I wrote my second book because I I took uh, like a, a four months time to write my thesis, and I started ri writing a fiction book. And usually that's what I do. I try to kind of not do something and then. I do something. Well, that's worked out pretty well for Excuse you. Excuse me. Really. Can we say uh, do do without doing and all will get done? Like the from Lao Tzu, right? You are Lao Tzu. Mm -hmm. <laughs> say it again. Yeah. Nice. You have a very heady. Yeah, you can. Too. Thank you. It's very heady. <laughs> we'll uh, just listen to your voice if we don't. Do understand. without doing and all will and all will get done. I think you're going to adopt that as a. I think it's true. 
But I think that you, I mean, uh, in a way, I think that that's what happens because if you're saying, I'm doing something else to avoid something else, it's a, it's a really kind of lovely way of doing. But, but I think that the, the, there is really some kind of a, 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 a the difference between us is that I think that for me, for me, that basically, a creativity is a way to deal with some a strongly felt restlessness. And with Myra, when I was with Myra, it always like it always seems that like I was kind of confused and stressed, and Myra was saying, "Oh, look at tornado, you know." <laughs> 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 and I think look we, I, th I think there's <laughs> there is something <laughs> there is uh, something like uh, 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 that we were like kind of an odd couple in that sense that everything kind of bothered me or got me stressed or I felt that I had this constant friction with reality while Myra was kind of floating above it, listening to people's voices and thinking about what cakes they would want to eat. It's true. But I'm anxious. I'm also anxious. So <laughs> <laughs> just I just hide <laughs> it better. <laughs> do you have um, artistic rituals? Do you have any rituals that you do um, to, to to get the creativity flowing or to, um, you know, or you may be worried that the it could dry up at some time, so you need to do, you know, like s uh, athletes have these uh, rituals that they do before a game, anything like that. I, you said something on a video, that's what made me think of it, uh, something about cranking the dog's tail seven times. What was that about? Oh, when we had a dog, I think we killed him by over cranking his <laughs> tail, but uh, that was just a superstition, you know, like kissing the door. I kiss the door when I leave the house. Mm. You know, I don't have a mezuzah, so it's a the you know imaginary. You kiss the door. I do. I ki no, I kiss the door ja limb, whatever it is. I, w I actually, it turns out I have a lot. Wait a minute, I'm <laughs> there's a horrible, horrible <laughs> problems. I step out with my right foot. My, the whole family knows that. I kiss the door. Uh, I do other things. I'm a whatever. As long as you don't lick the knob, it's okay. That's, it. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably next. <laughs> Uh, but none of this actually relates to creativity. No, so no, you're no. just doing this for no. other <laughs> reasons. Right. But are there any sort of artistic yeah. rituals, like when you sit down to work, that you have to have <laughs> your number two pencil or your, um, you know, the, the the one with the little nibs in it? Or you know, is there well, anything like that? I have, you know, for all my supplies. Yes, I have. I'm very specific about what I want and what I need, and uh, and so I have to know that I have all of those things. And I, and but I mean, in terms of a ritual, I probably. Uh, well, it used to be that I'd have a cigarette after I'd finish a painting, and then that was my great ritual of life, but now, then I stopped smoking. So. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, my mind it goes to coffee and the obits in the morning, and that sets me on the right pay pace, right really? place. Yeah. So, yeah, like, like, that is definitely a part of uh, your, your yeah. working day. Yes. Coffee and the obituaries. And walk right. Coffee, obits, and walking. And walking. Yeah. Okay. In that Very order. Speci yeah, in that order. Okay. You know, you can drink coffee in a disposable cup while you walk over the obituary page and you <laughs> save That's a lot right. of time. I mean, if I walk over to a cemetery <laughs> and um, <laughs> just hang out. Don't change her rituals. What are yours? Uh, well, uh, the thing is that, that I don't have any uh, uh, kind of a steady writing times or, you know, I, I kind of, uh, the way that my mind, uh, I started writing when I was in the army and I had to take those very long shifts more than 20 hours long, and I had nothing to do. <laughs> so I started writing, and uh, and I think that mostly what I do in life is I kind of, I write when I when I kind of finished all my chores, when I have nothing else to do. And uh, with life, I seem to have more and more chores, so I have less time. And I think that the way that it works with me is that there I think there is some kind of an evolutionary st struggle between ideas is that like every day I wake up and I have an idea for a story or a novel or something. And wha the way it happens is that let's say after a couple of weeks when I sit down to write, then only the, the strongest one re remains, you know? So if I, so I think my the way that works for me is that when I have an idea, I wait for a long time and if I don't forget it, then it must be. If it doesn't disappear okay. on you, then it's yeah. worth. Okay, um, you mentioned chores, <coughs> and I, I'm assuming that you're not only talking about, you know, cleaning the refrigerator, but um, the chores of a life in the arts, where both of you are now, y you have big careers, and I, 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 he I don't hesitate to use the word celebrity with with both of you, and um, how does that either add to or detract from 
your lives as artists? I, I can say that, that, uh, that uh, I like being famous. <laughs> really, because, because, you know, I, I, come, I come from, a, I, I married to family w uh, where, you know, Jonathan Geffen and Aviv Geffen, who are, you know, the father and the brother of, of my wife. And, and when I see Aviv, you know, who, who was a, a judge in a, in a popular m music show and it was really maybe the most... Uh, one of the most famous singers in Israel. How when I see his kind of famous, I don't want it, because uh, because he really like you know he sits in a cafe and people want to have a selfie with him just as he's trying to have a sandwich and he's very nice to everybody. But but it seems as if it bothers you. But the thing about people who like books, first of all, most of the times they don't know how you look like. But if they even if they know how you look like, there are people who like books, so they're usually kind of more. They're trained at being empathic, you know, because when you read a book, you, you imagine how life looks from other people's eyes. So I, I feel that I'm just kind of famous enough that, you know, that once every few days when I have a very off day, somebody will go to me in the street and say, you know, I really like that story. Or, you know, I don't know, me and my girlfriend read it on sunset somewhere, you know. And, and, and it kind of makes me feel useful. So, so it's a very... So for me, it's a very good experience, and I think that you know it's this kind of very contained kind of fame. You know, it's not the and being and Myra you famous. Know, you know, it's funny. I uh, that that it's ex you're describing exactly what I said about what I wanted my career to be like when I was probably in, in the beginning, and I had some kind of visions. Well, what would what is it that I want? And I thought, yeah, I I think I'd like some kind of fame, but limited, and hidden. And it's actually interesting to be able to do that and to have some once in a while people come up and say, oh, you know, you really, you, you helped me or something was funny or something like that. And that sense of you can really retract and, and be your own person in your own solitude and also have the, um, the options and the choices that you have when you have a certain kind of, you know, um, ability in this world and you can do interesting projects and, and you know, and meet interesting people. And and I think that the thing about art, let's say, when you write a book, is that uh, that I think that when you do something in life, I don't know, you invent the cellular phone, then some people like you, but others don't, you know. But when you, because you know, because their cousin got cancer from overusing it, or because it, I don't know, they get text messages all the time, and so I think everything that you create in life, people are either for it or against it. But I think the magical thing about art. The, the people who don't like it, it's irrelevant for them. You know, if you write a book that somebody doesn't like, he won't remember it. He would re read the page and then throw it away, you know? And I and there is something about this art as being some kind of a virtual space, you know, that kind of, that if you if it's good for you, you come in and you're grateful for that. And if you don't, it doesn't bother you. It's something that, especially when, when you live in, in a place so stressful as Israel, where basically everything you say, we, we knew some friends and we knew some enemies and both of them very kind of a priorically, regardless of what you've really meant, then then I think that, that nothing I is better than being an artist. It's like, you know, when my, my son was younger, he said to me uh, that he doesn't know what he wants to do when he, w w he grows up. And he said, I'd rather be, I, I, I'll either be an astronaut or a taxi driver. And I said to him, why do you want to be an astronaut? So he said, because I think it's uh, very exciting to be in a place that nobody, no human being had been before. And I said, well, why do you want to be a taxi driver? He said, because they make lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I said to him, you know, it's like, I think you should just find something that you like, you know, and, and, and if you'll be good at it, you know, you'll make money out of it too, you know, like, uh, I write stories and I make money out of it. He said, yes, but not as mu half as much as a taxi driver. <laughs> so, so I said to him, but you know, there are other things but money that you can get out of work. And he said, like what? And I said, you know, I, if you're a doctor, you get people's gratitude. You know, if you are a, a judge, you can get people's respect. You know, if you are a... If you do something really remarkable, you can get people's admiration. And he says, but what do you get from writing stories, you know, and it kind of made me stop. And I said, 
I get people's love. You know, people come to me in the street, people I don't know, and they project love at me. So he said, okay, so uh, be either be a, a writer or a taxi driver. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck astronaut, you know, who needs astronauts? They're just there, uh, you know. The <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> no. Um, uh, a last question, I think, before we um, get to, uh, we bring Jane Bordeaux back for a little more music. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, artistic obsession. Um, uh, we know from history there, there there's, Artistic obsession um, can bring a lot of artists to new work and to uh, exciting new things. I'm thinking of uh, the two examples that popped to my mind are um, Picasso uh, was obsessed with uh, Velazquez's uh, painting Las Meninas, the one with the girls in the little boxy dresses. And uh, he painted it one year 57 times. And of course, because he was Picasso, every one of those paintings became you know, a great painting in, uh, on, the, on the world stage, but he couldn't get beyond it. Or um, Beethoven was supposed to, uh, he was commissioned to do some work and he needed the money and he kept, uh, he wrote 33 variations on a, on a tune that's now known as the Diabelli variations. And, and his agent basically was saying to him, get, get over this obsession of yours um, you know, you need to earn money right now. You have these commissions, and he couldn't get beyond those uh, Diabelli variations. And of course, they've they've turned into a marvelous piece of music. Um, so, um, I, I, I want to know if you have any kind of artistic obsessions that have driven you at any particular time. Do you hook onto something, and then you kind of can't let it go, and and see that it turns into the art that you want to make or something new and surprising, or maybe it's taking you off of a path that you thought you wanted to be on. God, they both have these blank, <laughs> blank looks. No, it's a, I, 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 should, I should ask about cakes. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can say that, you know, when my father was alive, he said, I, I don't know if it's an artistic obsession, but he said, you know, in, o in almost all your stories, there are fathers, mm. He said, in half, of your, in half of your stories, they're stupid, <laughs> and in the other half, they're dead. <laughs> but in all of them, I feel that you love me. <laughs> so so I maybe, I maybe I have this kind of uh, father-child obsession. I write many stories about the relationship between fathers and their kids. And knowing that, does that make you want to do that more? Does it make you want to try and write something that doesn't have a father-son relationship in it? Well, I, I, th I think, uh, for, first of all, the truth is that not all my stories have it, but, but actually what I, I, I feel, I li like to write about father and son, I like to write about siblings, and they, I, feel, I feel that it doesn't matter how many stories I write about them, they always kind of seem to be different, at least to me, you know, I think, you know, maybe the readers would not feel the same, but, uh, but, f but for me, I, I, I think that there is something about, uh, it doesn't matter like if it's an obsession or not an obsession, I think, I think that it's like kind of trying to write a story is a little bit like kind of climbing on a mountain, so you need to, to find something to hold to, and if you, if you can hold on something that feels genuine, you know, and feels interesting, then it's a starting point from there you can go wherever you want. Okay, that's great. How about you, artistic obsessions? Um, I think that uh, what I am probably most interested in is the surprise and the uh, em emotional content of what's happening to me now or in the next hour or in the next day understanding that and understanding how that relates to to my obsession with my family and the history of my family and where they came from in Belarus and and stories that I re uh, that I repeat and paint over and over again so i'm really trying to combine i mean it's a sense of time i'm trying to combine and understand where i am in time which keeps changing and that I, that's probably my passion and my obsession. So I'd like to be surprised, which somehow slows down time, and also find out uh, find out how that intersects with time that's passed, and then make work, and then create work for the future. So um, I'm obsessed with time. 
I just heard um, Karl Oe Knausgaard um, at a conference in Iceland, and I just learned that he's going to be here like next week, I think, at the uh, festival in Jerusalem. Um, and uh, this is the the man who's written this uh, this book, among other things, My Struggle. It's thirty six hundred pages, and I, I remember just knowing that fact turned me off to reading somebody. You're like, well, why would you need thirty six hundred pages to say what you need to say? And after my listening, my mother would to say, quite a struggle. Quite <laughs> it's quite a struggle. Yes, <laughs> you realize that's called Mein Kampf in German, uh, and Min Kamp in Norwegian, which in, in the language he writes in. Um, but um, after hearing him talk about it, he said basically what you were just saying. Um, he said something about uh, uh, really exploring the minute-by-minute-ness of life in order to understand it. And he made such a convincing case for himself as a person who um, doesn't figure out life until he writes about it. And after hearing him, I thought, okay, I, I get that. I understand it. That's a that's a that's a wonderful obsession. I mean, if you can sit down and write, you know, thousands of pages of text, and people are loving what he writes, uh, you know, it's very interesting. So um, we are going to invite uh, Jane Bordeaux back. They're going to magically appear again. I hope. Um, yes, please. No, no, don't get off the stage. Please stay here. And uh, uh, Jane Bordeaux, please. <laughs> Hello again. Como da yaga ksham im reshet asuya khorim בסירת עץ קטנה, מיטלטלת במים סוערים. לא ויתרת, לא אמרת נואש. והלב שלי חזר לפעום מחדש. כמו צדפה על החול שנשטפה אל החוף בלי ברירה. הנה בגל גדול, סוחר אותה בחזרה. כבר ויתרתי, כמעט אמרתי נואש, והלב שלי חזר לפעום מחדש. איך אפשר שלא להתאהב?
enjoyed your evening and it seemed very interesting <laughs> and uh, thank you for inviting us this will be our last song Sit and wonder why, babe If you don't know by now It ain't no use to sit and wonder why It don't matter anyhow When the rooster crows at the break of dawn Look out your window and I'll be gone You're the reason I'm traveling on But don't אלמון, אמיר זאבי, מתי גלעד, ג'יין בורדו. And before you three go, before you three go, ג'יין בורדו, wait one second, I just want it, everybody should know, they have this amazing, amazing music video for a song that they didn't sing here tonight called Ma'agalim. It is a piece of art. It's a beautiful song, but it's also a piece of art. And if you don't know it already, you've got to watch it. It's really gorgeous. So thank you. Um, I also saw there were a lot of you singing the words with them. So uh, there's clearly Your an audience, nicer and I think it's just my through. brothers. That's right. <laughs> nicer it's voices. even nicer than my brothers, yeah. Um, before we come, yeah. 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 You know, we, um, on our travels, we traveled with uh, a writer, uh, Dekla Kedar, who's sitting over there. And uh, th it was an extraordinary experience also to intersect with another person who's looking at us 
and who may or may not be writing about us. We'll see what we, we'll see what we find out. Um, and that and and how those relationships can intersect. So it was really wonderful to travel with you. Thank you. And, um, uh, yeah. and to Hadal. And to Hadal. Hadal. And I don't, what, what's Hadal's last name? Where are you? <laughs> there you go. Okay. What is it? Seifan. So, and Hadal was photographing us, which is mm. really a challenge with, well, we need to So there are pictures of the cake wall and, and yeah. everything else. Well, that, that actually that was a different photographer, but yeah. Fine. But, uh, yeah. but uh, we also want, want uh, to thank yes. Liran and Moti and Paulina and all the people from Mishkanot that made this happen. You yeah. Know, really thank you very much. I think this yeah. is an incredible place that it's an incredible it doesn't place. function li like, you know, the standard uh, uh, lit uh, art place, but v v all the time is innovative and, and uh, listens and is in, in a dialogue with artists and it's very special. Edgar, were you reading my notes? Oh, okay. Because you got there before me, and I'm glad you did. I'm glad you yeah. did, because hearing it from the people who were, you know, uh, enjoying the residency here, that was that was really great. So again, Monty Schwartz sitting here, the uh, director general of uh, Mishkanot Anonim, and Liran Golo, the artistic director, and Paulina Stemmler, program director, and Benny up here, and, and Aviv, and everybody. They, they do an incredible job, and everything works the way it's supposed to. It's really exciting. Um, I love working with Mishkanot, and I hope that, was that enough to get Invited back? Okay, <laughs> good, thank you. Um, I want to give each of, we, each of you the opportunity for a final word. Is there something you'd like to say that didn't get said that needs to be said? Some piece of wisdom, some message, some artistic direction? Yeah, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're not going to listen anyway, come on. <laughs> you're going to think about cakes, I know. Well, I have something, a quote from each of you. Um, so I thought if you couldn't pop up with something at the last moment, then I would provide it for you because it's yours anyway. So here, I'm giving it back to you. So from Etko, um, we all know how we get into this world and how we are going to go out. And if you can do something in the middle, something meaningful that will affect the lives of others, then you're really, really lucky. I'm not talking about the work, but about yourself. And you are really, really lucky. And I think that's beautiful. <laughs> and from Myra, and I think these two go together, these statements. What I am almost always thinking about is simplicity. I'm trying to figure out two very simple things, how to live and how to die. And then um, in a different place in that same video, uh, you said uh, you were talking about the Bach cantata that's called Ich hab genug. And uh, Myra says, I originally thought that that meant I've had enough already, <laughs> but then later learned that it means I have enough, I'm alive, that's enough, end of discussion. And that's the end of our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, all of you.